Uh, Gerd Leonard, in your book, uh, Technology vs. Humanity, you write, uh, the future does not uh, happen to us, what we are act actually uh, involved in is. Uh, but sometimes I, I got another feeling. <laughs> well, I, I think we decide the future based on our inaction. So we don't do anything and the future just kind of happens, right? like climate change right? mm -hmm. uh, or automation. So we don't do anything and somebody else like the oil companies or, you know, automation companies, they decide. Right? Or we say that, you know, we want to be more proactive. We want to create something that we want. Like with genetic engineering, we decide, okay, we, we don't want people to experiment with the human genome without a global understanding. So we take action, right? And either way, I think we decide what we want from the future. And, you know, just 10 years ago, it was basically about technology having limits, so we couldn't do certain things. You know, it was impossible, like language translation, AI, you know, uh, autonomous cars. But in 10 years, we have everything that we have to decide is just an ethical, societal question. It's not a technology question anymore because technology will be unlimited. Mm -hmm. So if you assume that technology will have unlimited power in 10 years, we're going to have to decide what we want you know, rather than what we can do. Yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, I read your book, Technology versus Humanity. I think it's a great read, um, but I was also struck by the title because it's Technology versus Humanity, but you also write in your book that uh, also the ancient Greeks were thought that technology is what makes us human. So why did you choose for that sort of contradiction in the title? Yes, well, you know, as it goes with publishers, you know, I had a publisher when I started with the book and, and he said it would be more progressive, you know, more, more aggressive to say technology versus humanity. I wanted to call it technology and humanity. Mm -hmm. So that's still my intent. I think that technology can be against humanity if we do it wrong. Generally speaking, technology is a godsend. You know, we are inventing so many amazing things. Right? I think there's just something that we have to do is to govern technology. Uh, again, you know, today, the biggest problem like Facebook, social media is that we haven't governed it. It's not that it exists. Right? It's a good tool, mm -hmm. right? but it's governed really badly. <laughs> and if that's going to continue, we're not going to govern AI or geoengineering. We're going to be in deep trouble. Right? So it's technology is neutral until we use it. Right? William Gibson said, right. um, and That's true. I mean, it's, it, technology can be good or bad. I mean, nuclear power isn't good or bad. It's just how do we use it in such a way that it's good for us? And, and that question wasn't so important 10 years ago because most of it wasn't working. Yeah. <laughs> and now everything is working. So, yeah, that's my true intent with the book is to say, you know, this, we cannot go backwards and put away technology, you know, whether it's human brain interfaces or you know, computer brain interfaces or, or whatever it is. We can't go back. We can only go forward, but we do have to think about consequences uh, and also protection, uh, protection of our humanness, yeah. uh, which is not technology. You know, we are not just technology. <laughs> we have things that are very hard to define, so we have to protect those. Yeah. But you also give keynotes all around the world. We just uh, spoke about it because you're today happily in Amsterdam. That's why we arranged this interview. And, um, but if you ask the question to the audience, what is what makes us human? I think the people in China or Brazil in the United States, they have not maybe inside the country, they have a different answer or don't they? Uh, generally speaking, yes. But of course, you know, we, we do have some agreement on what makes us human generally you know, even on a global level. And, and what makes us human is, of course, we are, uh, we are wired to look for relationships, for engagement, for experiences. We don't really, we're not really driven by data, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we're driven by non-data. Uh, and also humans generally strive for happiness and self-realization. That's the same across all countries. Um, and I would say 99.9% of people that I meet, they want to remain human. You know, they don't want to be superhuman. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, they may want to be superhuman, but without losing the human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, so I think we have a lot more agreement than we think about what we want. Uh, there's always going to be people who want to, you know, become God or, you know, become whatever they have, which is their freedom to do that. Right. But I think generally speaking, we have agreements on many things that we have not turned into policy. Right? If we, if we want to remain human, we have to protect our data and we have to control the machines 
And I think we would have a lot more agreement on that than we think, maybe not. Mm, yeah. And in your book, you also write that the, uh, the two main developments that influence our future at, at the moment in which you wrote it were artificial intelligence and human genome editing or uh, biotechnology. Do you still think these are the two biggest um, technologies at the moment? Well, there's increasingly more. Of course, most of them are subsections of others, like, uh, you know, what's happened with the cloud and with data and computing. We're moving to supercomputing and quantum computing, which is going to enable, you know, 100 trillion data feeds in real time to be analyzed. We can't do that today. And that all hangs together with AI, because if AI does not get real-time data, then it's useless. Right? Uh, so they, it's basically what I call... Um, overlapping and the sort of uh, uh, the approach of combinatorial power of technology. Yeah? Uh, that's all in this bag of AI and data. That's one big thing. The other thing is changing us and, and changing, you know, materials or, or plants or animals or, you know, nanotechnology, geoengineering. I mean, basically changing things, you know, reprogramming the human. That's one big yeah. uh, topic. And the other one, of course, is if we want other food, then we're going to program the food. Yeah. yeah, and that's the same topic, really. So those, that's why those are the two really main topics. And, and then, of course, there's this whole topic of energy and, and climate change, which is kind of related to the first two. But right now, it's looking as if we're going to have 20 years of very, very hard reality to deal with climate change. I mean, Amsterdam, right? <laughs> um, and we're going to spend trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars on adapting and mitigation, and that is going to be our, you know, what we have created. But in 20 years, I think we can probably go backwards and fix it because we'll have the tech, like mm, fusion yeah. power and, and decarbonization machines yeah, and many trees planted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the next 20 years, yeah, yeah that, that's the reality is that now it's mostly about preparing. Right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a very big shift. Yeah. But I think it's an. Int I still have to read the book uh, called uh, I think the Wizard and the Prophet, because what you say about uh, the climate problem that maybe we are one invention ahead of fixing the climate problem, for example. But uh, yeah, on the other hand, we still have to do things right now. So that also makes the debate about climate change uh, really diffuse. I think. Yeah, it's it's difficult to talk about things that will happen in 50 years. Yeah. Um, humans generally are not very good at foresight, uh, turning foresight into, <laughs> into action. Yeah. yeah. We are usually reactive. Yeah. You know, so we had nuclear bombs. <laughs> Sorry. So we had nuclear bombs. Yeah. And after we had the two bombs, we said, okay, we, we don't want to have 2,000 bombs. You no. know? And we came to an agreement. And now we're going to need to say, well, you know, we have genome editing, we have AI, and we probably have some incident, you know, like a disaster that will cause us. Yes. But we already have the disaster as far as climate change is concerned. So now it's clear to everyone that's going to take huge preference over pretty much any other topic. And we haven't really realized what that means. For example, you know, uh, barring cruise ships, a change of the entire shipping industry, going vegan, You know, a change in the way that we eat. I mean, it's going to entail so many things like mandatory taxes for flying on the airplane. I mean, that's all going to happen in the next 10 years. So you better be ready for this, you know, because because when the summer gets to be five degrees hotter in southern France, that's basically a desert then. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And so that we're going to see all those things. And I think we're not really prepared for what that means on an economic standard. Yeah. No. And uh, later I will ask you, how do you... Um, uh, make scenarios, look at the future, etc. Uh, but one uh, um, one of my focus of expertise is human enhancement, and you also write about uh, transhumanism in the book. Uh, but you also put another term against it called uh, exp exponential humanism, if I might recall. Um, uh, why do you think that's important to have like an, uh, something against transhumanism or a different view on? Yeah, this is a difficult question because basically, you know, ad adapting ourselves, like taking a pill or improving ourselves has kind of become normal. Right? But I think that what happens is if we're going beyond a certain level, we're replacing things that we think can be done better. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I have a car accident, I lose my legs, I can get a prosthesis, you know. And if I have a million euros, it can be very nice, the prosthesis, yeah. yeah? 
that's different than me saying I want better legs because I want to climb Mount Everest and removing my legs and paying. That's completely different. So if I have uh, if I have a genome situation or a biome situation that that will cause me to have cancer. Could I possibly mute the gene and not get cancer? Yeah, well, that's one thing, yeah, even though that's pretty far away in reality. But for me to say, I want to be a super soldier right, and be three times as strong and I, I work on my genes, that's another thing. So I think the thing for us is to distinguish between what actually makes us better humans, uh, more happy, not just faster, bigger you know, and, and, and turn that into a weapon. Right? So I always say the idea of becoming a superhuman is probably a downgrade, you know, for us, uh, not an upgrade, because there's so many things that make us human that we're going to impact by changing the way that we are. Right? I mean, imagine if you were working in virtuality using HoloLens or whatever the whole day, right? And it would really work, which currently kind of does. But, but say it really works, you would get used to an environment to work where you are working in, you know, a thousand times as fast as today. And then when you get home, there is your lame <laughs> dinner meeting with your kids, you know. Yeah. And they're not in that exponential reality. And that causes huge amount of confusion. Mm. And I think we need to distinguish between the things that we want and that we can do. Yeah. Yeah, it also makes me think about, uh, for example, if you have uh, exoskeletons as, as a way to upgrade yourself, uh, does your brain also have to adapt to uh, your increased power or your increased uh, stamina, etc.? So most of the things that, that you uh, talk about are also how does our uh, a monkey brain uh, <laughs> react right. to these te technologies? Well, this is not a black or white question. You know? For example, Elon Musk is saying we could have a neural lace connecting us to the internet. And I would say that's great if you're paraplegic, if you're sick or your brain doesn't work or if your brain dead or, you know, whatever. Uh, if you need to be uh, healed, right? then we can try anything. Right? But the logic of saying I'm not enough as a human, I have to drill a hole to my head and then connect to the AI to compete, I think that's crazy. Right? Mm. I mean, that is a crazy proposition because we don't know a lot of things ab about the context. Even if we did know, it's a question of, uh, as Marshall McLuhan said once, every time we extend, we also amputate. And so we extend our lives with a tech thing and then we, we lose something else. And I think if we lose too much of what it makes us human, then we become part of the machine. Mm. And there are people, many people are arguing that this wouldn't matter because we are already a machine, right? to which I would say that I don't believe that's true. And even if it was, I would rather not become a machine because we would lose our advantages. So that's my argument against the singularity and transhumanism is that I think it'll be mostly a downgrade and we won't be very happy. Yet. That's my fear. Mm, yeah. But on the other hand, and that's, that's also uh, uh, which we started the interview with, Um, uh, take, for example, plastical surgery that was first invented to cure sick people that came from the uh, from the war. And now we use it also to upgrade ourselves. So it might be if you have the, the same line of logic with the Neuralace example that people are willing to use that uh, to hook themselves to the Internet. Of course, well, uh, people are, I mean, many people are willing to do many things, you know. <laughs> people take drugs so that they can think quicker or, I mean, you know, remember LSD and all these experiments about consciousness. And mm. so um, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying that, you know, we, we have to be very careful about using those kind of tools to alter ourselves and then there's no way back. You know, we can no longer exist without it. Uh, and technology is already a religion. You know, we believe in technology. If technology becomes God, then we're going to, you know, adore technology, try to become technology. And then before we know it, you know, we, we no longer really exist. And, and I think that the danger there is not like, you know, we're, we're going to address urgent issues in our body, but that we're going to completely rethink ourselves and anything is possible. Right? I mean, ma imagine if you weren't dying. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, imagine if you got to live 200 years and imagine if that cost a million euros and only you could do it, you know, and not the others. I mean, those are all probably much bigger issues than we can even remotely tackle at this point. Yeah. But for uh, solving these kinds of problems, because we now live in a capitalistic era, at least here in Europe and the United States, 
it makes also like the um, there's an opportunity that that these developments will happen because also of the political and economical and etc. Uh, so that's even a larger shift, I think, for us to change that if we want to. Yes. Well, I think the the, uh, the the capitalist system as we know it is ending because of technology. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make any sense for us to create something that could potentially make a hundred trillion dollars, but in the process of it, we're ruining. We're going to ruin the planet and ourselves, and then we have lots of money. I mean, mm-hmm. this this makes no sense. Nobody would want to live on a on a dead planet just because they have money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, you can go to Mars after you've ruined the planet. You know, that's probably Zuckerberg's plan. But uh, I think this is something that that's very hard to grasp. You know, I th- I think the priority in the future will be that capitalism will be extended to what I call sustainable capitalism. Right? And right now it's not sustainable. It's just about profit and growth, you know, GDP and jobs. And, you know, it's like any politician who promises more jobs gets more votes, you know. Mm-hmm. In the future, I call this the quadruple bottom line, people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. And it's kind of mentioned in the book already in, in, well, in the triple bottom line. But now there's four. So in the future, we're going to have stock markets that will say, you know, what is your company doing for people? How much money do you make? Are you sustainable? And we're going to see stock markets that will have only those companies listed. Right? So from IKEA to Lego to uh, uh, Patagonia to Unilever, mm. you know, who are going to say, you know, this is more important than stockholder value. Um, yeah. Which is a totally outmoded concept. Uh, stockholder value is great, but then the stockholders get lots of money and, and everybody else is kind of lost, you know. Yeah. And that is a very bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's still I I, uh, I think about the book uh, Donut Economy. That's also about a n- new way or to think about the economy. Maybe the, yeah, that's also uh, fit in. Um, and if I can place a critique. Um, uh, in which I should say that I'm also, of course, living in the Netherlands, which is in Europe. But I have the feeling that you are uh, sort of the European futurist, in which I you seem to focus a lot of uh, on ethics and morality. Do you think it's a European school of thought? And um, is it something in which Europe then still be, can be competitive in AI and biotech, etc.? Well, you could argue that, you know, if you're, uh, if you're in a country or in a situation that is evil, that if you are more evil, then you'll be busy, right? Uh, I mean, that is, would have been a great argument to make for Germany about 60 years ago. You know, people collaborated because, you know, they, they wanted to go forward. Yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, the bottom line really is, you know, I, li- I lived in America for 17 years. So I'm very familiar with the mindset. I go to China a lot and I'm familiar with that mindset. You know, in Europe, we are humanists. That's just what makes us Europe. You know, so humanist means we care about other things than money uh, in some cases, right? So we care about happiness, we care about collective good, we pay taxes for the collective good. You know, we believe that if we are doing well, that some of that should go to the others, so they can do well. Very basic stuff, you know. In America, it's an extreme form of capitalism, right? Which has led to so many issues that it's a countless list of what is going wrong there, you know? Apart from which, it's still an amazing country because of the spirit of entrepreneurship, right? So how do we combine the two? And, and then China, of course, is the other angle, which is the same in America, but the state rather than the money. Yeah, well, the state and the money, same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? So here in Europe, I think we have a huge advantage now because we do have a lot of intellectual resources. We have great researchers. Once we are the United States of Europe, which is coming, despite all of the bad signs, at this point, then, you know, will be a, a power to reckon with that is based on humanism, but also progressive exponential humanism. Right? And that's what I'm hoping for. So I'm not, you know, I think this kind of idea of saying that, you know, the American way of doing things or the Silicon Valley way of, way of doing things, uh, we can learn from that, but it's in many ways, in terms of philosophy, it's socially bankrupt, you know, mm. in my view. Yeah. Um, but still, I think it's uh, uh, difficult. You also write that um, uh, why we are not changing the current um, uh, paradigm is because of, if I remember, profits, uh, regulation, and addiction. Um, how do you see? Do you see uh, promising developments on on these terrains or another 
I, I see many promising things. I mean, since, since the book came out three years ago, the concept of digital ethics has become widespread. It's become a standard to have a digital ethics manifesto or a team or, you know, in Singapore and Denmark, everywhere. Right? And just two weeks ago, the CEO roundtable in the U.S., announced that shareholder profit was no longer going to be the number one objective of a company. Mm. Well, not because of my book, I don't think, but, you know, <laughs> but in any case, you know, I mean, this was like, you know, all the guys from JP Morgan and what they all said, basically, this idea of shareholder value as being supreme is ridiculous right? because it leads to complete abuse. You know, that's why Facebook is a, the leading financial stock in the digital world, but it's also the leading polluter of our minds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's kind of like an oil company, you know, in so many ways. So that needs to be fixed. And I, I really believe I see great uh, starting points here. We're starting to realize that the global issues that we have, which are disease, war, food, energy, water, you know, we can't solve those in a, in a country, yeah. not even in Europe. You know, this is, these are global issues. And other issues like values, ethics, you know, religion, whatever it is, that we cannot solve with technology. Yeah. When that's a social process. But, but technology will enable us by solving all of those problems one by one. And then we say, you know, now we have all these gains. Why don't we just give it back to the population, you know, rather yeah. than keeping it with the corporations? Yeah. Yeah. And I think also with regulation, that's uh, with the European GDPR, uh, there are also some critique on it, but it's still, I think, a, a leap forward compared to the old situation. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, GDPR is a pain for everybody, including myself, you know, emailing and so on. Uh, but I think it's it's good to go back to what it should have been in the beginning, which is that I have to opt in. Uh, I don't have to opt out of all this stuff. You know, I have to opt in. That's different, right? And that, was, that I think that's a very, very good point. And that's also something that the internet economy has brought about and that we thought it would be liberating, but it was captivating and, and also, uh, you know, jailing us in so many ways. So. And that needs to be changed. And I think underlying that whole change discussion is not that we have different opinions, but the capitalist system that we have today enforces bad behavior, Mm. Uh, and in some cases it doesn't matter because it's not a big deal you know we there's adjustment but in many cases it matters a lot because you know bad behavior leads to more consequences and then the state has to pick up the bill you know yeah and so i think that's basically what's happening is that there's so many side effects of technology that the state ends up having to pay for people who have killed themselves or you know because of social media or what have you right the state ends up with the bill yeah yeah, so you don't have much up with uh, libertarianism and uh, uh, that there are no states, for example. Uh, I think there are some good things about it. You know, I, uh, looking at some of the principles, I think I can be friendly with that. I just think that in this world, we're going to need a strong state and very, very, very good and wise politicians. Well, in fact, I would say they're no longer politicians. They'll be more like Socrates or Aristotelus, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're going to have professional people dealing with these issues that are not elected because we're going to need people who are, you know, a, a cross-section of people who are going to look at why AI needs to stop at a certain point. Uh, and those can't be working for the military or they, they can't be uh, people who have to fight for the election every four years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's many things that democracy is going to go through. We're going to have a global government. That's, uh, I mean, we kind of have the UN, you know, but a truly global government. But first we'll have the United States of Europe. That will be the first step, you know, roughly 10 years, I think. How does your, more on a personal note, how does your, your, your process work to uh, have these forecasts or scenarios? Um, can you give us a little insight? Yeah, that's why, you know, they're... A trick of the trade. <laughs> because, I, because I work on foresights rather than predictions, you know, it's, it's pretty safe, I think. Most of what I've said 10 years ago has happened. There's a few things I didn't expect, like the Brexit and, and Trump, you know, which, of course, are human factors. You know, they're not, they, and they cannot be analyzed as easily or, or you don't have foresights about human behavior. That's very hard. Some people do, but, you know, Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke, maybe Kurzweil, you know. But I think generally speaking, that's very difficult. So, you know, I said that music, you know, uh, 2005, I said music is going to move into the cloud and we're going to pay for it like water, right? And that was clear. Everybody would have told you, right? So that is what happened. Um, now I talk about data as the new oil for 10 years, and it's finally true. Data is the most powerful thing in the world. 
Mm. It's not all or, or gas or money or banking or. And then now I'm saying basically it's the end of oil is coming. Uh, we're going to switch to an entirely new way of doing energy, and um, that's ten years away. I think that everybody can feel that. You know, uh, biology is converging with technology. You know, we're not going to take pills for high blood pressure in the future. You know, we'll, we'll have other ways to to address this. Right? Mm -hmm. And those are the really obvious things. So by and large, what I do is pretty obvious. Um, if you have time to look at it, it's not really rocket science. You know? I mean, it's intuition, right? Yes. Um, and I also said, you know, seven or eight years ago that the internet, the business model of surveillance and tracking is unsustainable. Right? And that's what we have now. You know, we're, we're at the point where we're saying this can't be true. You know, we're being like, yeah. I mean, Facebook is worse than the NSA, right? yeah. except for that it doesn't talk about it. <laughs> you know? And there's no Snowden at Facebook. Yeah. And what's your general feeling if you think about future? I'm an optimist. I think, you know, we're still early in the process of technology becoming a superpower in the sort of godlike sense, you know, on a scale of one to a hundred, we're only at four or five. There's still many factors like, you know, we have to, for the machines that we use, we have to use the, the minerals from Africa and, you know, and, and internet speed is not so good. And uh, in many ways, I mean, that's still like a, we have 10 years, right? So that's, I think I'm an optimist also, because I think technology can solve so many things for us except that we shouldn't use it to solve our own social and political problems or reprogram ourselves so we can be stronger. So to me, it's like, that's the good thing. But the bad thing is we have to deal with the consequences of having solved those issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and that means new laws and we, we're going to need wise government politicians. That's an oxymoron, right? In Europe, we have some wise politicians. That's good. That's why I'm so proud of Europe. You know, that's many other countries don't have that. Uh, yeah, we have that in the US too, but they are marginalized, you know, and, and they don't, they don't ever seem to get anywhere. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think that is a real challenge is, you know, I, that's why I have suggested we should have a driver's license for politician, a driver's license for the future. Mm. So to be a politician or a mayor or a public official, you have to pass the future test. The future test. Yeah. Uh, and what, and, um, do, what do you notice in your own um, uh, use of technology? Do you also find yourself sometimes addicted to social media, etc.? Yeah, not social media is not really my thing. I left Facebook a year and a half ago for philosophical reasons, not so much for my own use. I mean, yeah, I love technology. I use, I try out everything and I find sometimes I'm, I'm too busy with it. But generally speaking, I, I create some rules. Like, you know, for example, I don't allow notifications on my phone. Yeah. Mm. SMS, you know, my kids on WhatsApp or so, but otherwise, no, I, I don't want to hear that you have an update, you know? Mm. Uh, so I turn all that off. I, I have a special phone I take when I go somewhere that does not connect to the internet, mm. uh, a, a dumb phone. Right? Oh, yeah. I go out for dinner without a phone. I don't have the phone in my bedroom. So, you know, and then when I go hiking, I, yeah, I try to take a wheel camera rather than the, you know, <laughs> well, of course, now the phones are real cameras, right? Yeah. But in any case, I mean, I you create limits. And, and also, I think it's natural to say that, you know, enough of a good thing is just enough. You know, it's like, you know, you enjoy a glass of wine, but you wouldn't drink a bottle for breakfast. You know, it, it's kind of the same thing with technology. Yeah, right? yeah. And we need help with this. You know, I think especially kids need help by saying, you know what, it's probably better if you build a sandcastle here on the beach rather than watching something on the iPad. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. um, because that's that's how we develop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gad Leonard, author of uh, Technology versus Humanity. Uh, where can people find more information about you? Yeah, so it's you know, it's pretty easy. If you just put in Gerd, my name, G-E-R-D, and Futurist, then you'll see like a million links on YouTube. But my main website is futuristgerd, G-E-R-D dot com. Uh, YouTube is very big. I have like 700 hours worth of stuff on YouTube. You find that on gertube.com. That's a shortcut, but it's just YouTube. Right? So grdtube.com. In my book, of course, Tech versus Human, Tech vs. Human. Um, now available in 10 languages. Yeah, lots of stuff there to read. I think uh, the book is probably the best place to start. You know, it's, it's a good manifesto. Two or three hours on the airplane <laughs> can... Uh, can get you somewhere. Yeah, I w would also recommend your book. So uh, thank you. Thank you for this interview. You're welcome.